Hello, and welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. My name is Michael McKeever, and I'll be your host today. Now, as many of you already know, Iris Acker, the original creator and producer of Spotlight on the Arts, has passed away. Everyone here is deeply saddened by this, but at the same time, we are happy to be continuing her legacy. It was her wish that this show continue, and Beacon TV has gladly accepted to take it on. Like a true theater person, Iris always said, the show must go on. And so, here we go. Let me introduce you to our panel for today. Karen Stevens. Karen is an award-winning actress who can be seen performing all over South Florida. Bill Hirschman. Bill is an arts journalist and the founder of FloridaTheaterOnStage.com. And Jeffrey Short. Jeff is an accomplished actor, director, and vocalist, and a music producer. Now, before we meet our guest today, let's take a look at a short video clip. By now, you've probably figured it out. Our guest today is an accomplished musician and educator. He keeps the rhythm going with his phenomenal drumming. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Roy Fantel. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Roy. Thank Hi, you for Roy. being here. Thank you for having me. All right, let's, let's start right with the very beginning. How did you become a drummer? How did you decide that you were going to become this, this musician? As a young kid, uh, I was always just banging on stuff, banging on the table. And then uh, in elementary school, uh, we had a band program, and uh, they asked us to pick instruments, and I wanted to play the drums. And the band director said, we have too many drums already, pick something else. <laughs> so I chose the saxophone. That lasted half a year. Next year came around, uh, they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to play the drums. <laughs> band director said, we have too many drums, pick <laughs> something else. So my uh, parents went to the school, talked to the band director, and said, look, you know, he wants to play the drums. He said, we have a lot of drummers. I can't promise he'll be in the concert. They said, we don't care, just give them the opportunity. So I played drums and the rest is history. Wow. Just, just, yeah, took to it very naturally. So you had a natural uh, ability. I had a natural affinity for it. Nice. Yeah, and just loved it. Nice. Did you yeah. learn to read music? Yes. So in school, in band program, we learned to read music and uh, played all through uh, school and through college. And uh, yeah, reading music is a huge part of what I do. Yeah, because you know a lot of drummers don't. So that's why I asked. A lot of musicians yeah. don't. A lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately. You know, Roy, I went through the same thing. Uh, I was a drummer, too, as a, as, a, as a kid and a teenager. And I was also started with a different instrument, the saxophone. And the embouchure was so hard to develop that I went to drums as well. Mm -hmm. I have to give my parents so much credit because back then, Growing up in the 70s and 80s, there were no digital drums, so everything was loud oh, yeah. all the time. So <laughs> are you encouraging your students now to continue with this drum path, and now it's not such a, you're not disturbing the neighbors, you're not disturbing your parents? I, I have a lot of students, <laughs> and they ask me when, you know, when, they, when it's time to buy equipment, you know, should they get electronic drums or real drums? And I understand the need, you know, for quiet. I had a basement, you know, this was in New York where we had basements, there was no water mm -hmm. table, so I could play down there and <laughs> they would just bang on the floor when they wanted me to stop. But uh, it's important for me to have beginners actually play on real drums uh, to, to understand proper technique. Uh, for novices like me, what is the difference between a real drum and an electronic drum? How does... So it's mainly the, the surface and the, and the technology's improved and the, the surfaces are getting better to play on. Um, you know, they used to be just very, very hard plastic, the original electronic mm -hmm. drums. And you could actually hurt, physically do damage to yourself 
Uh, if you like don't practice pad. Yeah, surface, if you don't have yeah. the right technique. But yeah, I started on a practice pad, as most kids do. Um, and that felt more like a, an acoustic drum. But now you're, you're, you're a percussionist in the sense that while you'll play a trap set, you, there are other percussion instruments that you've played. I've seen you do this. What are yes. some of the other, what's the range of things that you uh, well, perform? Well, uh, you know, I, I did study classical percussion in college, so I had to play timpani and xylophone, you know, all the mallet instruments, uh, a lot of hand percussion and miscellaneous little wood blocks, cowbells, all that sort of stuff. Um, percussion ensemble in college was probably one of my greatest musical experiences because you get to play all sorts of weird percussion instruments, and also you learn how to fit into uh, the bigger picture, mm -hmm. rhythmically, you know, how everybody fits together, and it was a, it was a great educational experience. Do you play congos? Uh-huh. Yeah. I just did a gig a couple weeks ago with a pianist and a sax player, and I was playing uh, congas and bongos. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Exotic. <laughs> yes. You play um, in, well, just about every theater in South Florida in, um, in uh, throughout all three uh, counties. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that work? How do, do you, as a percussionist, um, book a gig? In other words, uh, if, say, a theater is doing a production of uh, Hello, Dolly, or Fun Home, or something like that, right. how, how does that work? Do you audition for it? Do they call you? How does no, that work? most often the music director gets to choose the musicians that they want to work with. Um, and so initially it was just a lot of networking and meeting uh, different people, going to theaters, uh, um, fortunately, my wife is also a music director, um, well, well, so she hires me. I was going to say, let's, <laughs> let's talk about that. You are one of the power couples in South Florida theater. Uh, your wife is the wonderfully talented musical director, or music director, Carol Fantel. Mm -hmm. How did you guys meet? We actually met doing a show. Upstate New York, uh, there was a very small equity theater up in Cohoes, and um, they were doing nonsense, and Carol needed a drummer and she called uh, another music director in the area to see if they could recommend somebody, and my name was given to her. And so I came in, and I actually had to audition for that because she wanted to make sure hey, I could play. I had my own drums, and I had a car. <laughs> <laughs> so I came in and uh, auditioned, and we uh, played Nonsense. She was the resident musical director. I hope the requirements director. for marriage were a little bit more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so. I needed a passport as well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we started playing shows together up there uh, for many years. Uh, How long have you guys been married now? We've been married uh, 23 years. Wow. So when, you're, when you get a show, uh, typically a musical, a local musical that uh, Zoetic is doing or Slow Burn is doing or someone is doing, most civilians don't realize how that process works. They think you're sitting there on day one of rehearsals, the right. entire combo. Talk a little bit about when do you get the score? Do you practice ahead of time? Do you have any rehearsals before Sits Probe, the whole right. nine yards? Talk about so, that. So uh, obviously the, the cast goes in before the musicians are called in to work through uh, learning the music and blocking, whatever. And then the musicians are called in. I'll get the music typically two to three weeks ahead of time. Um, and then uh, if there are cast recordings, I'll go and listen to those and follow the music at home. Uh, to get a sense uh, of what the you know what I should be doing. Uh, also, a big part of it is going through the uh, instrument list for percussionists. There's typically a lot of stuff involved, depending upon the show. So I need to go through that, see what I need, and then figure logistically how I'm going to set everything up. So I'll do that at home. I'll work through the music, uh, play along with tracks if they're available, and work out the choreography because there's also a lot of stick changes, mallet changes, things that have to be done. You know, behind the scenes, that, again, people aren't aware of. It's, people don't realize it, but it's there's, a, like you said, a choreography that happens for the yes. musicians as well. Yeah. And uh, then when do you get with actors? When do you actually get So typically, get with actors? Uh, the ideal situation is we do at least one band rehearsal before we get with the cast. That isn't always the case. Uh, sometimes we'll do it right into Sits Probe. And so the and, band and is playing it for the first time but, with the cast. But what is this Sits Probe you speak of? <laughs> so a Sits Probe <laughs> is basically a sing-through of all the music uh, with the cast and the band for the first time. So they just go through all the musical numbers and work out any issues uh, that have to be uh, dealt with before we actually then start rehearsal with staging and lines and all that. One of the hot topics in musical theater these days with technology and also with budgetary constraints and space constraints of many theaters themselves is the use of tracks. Mm -hmm. You know, as a musician and a producer myself, I, I'm a big believer in creating as much work 
for live musicians as we possibly can. And also there's no experience like it for the audience to have sure. a live orchestra. But that's not always possible. And I know that you, uh, Fantel Music, does some recording of tracks and producing of tracks. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your thoughts about the use of tracks in, in musical theater and that trend that's, that happens and is sure. growing seemingly right. these yeah. days? Yeah, well, I mean, ideally, you know, musical theater as an art form is meant to be actors and musicians together creating something on the spot because it's never the same twice. When you have tracks, you kind of lose that spontaneity. And also sometimes if there's an issue on stage, you can't really adjust the track uh, to match the performer, mm -hmm. whereas live musicians can make those adjustments as needed. So that being said, you know, there are budgetary constraints, you know, especially smaller theaters just starting out, um, and professional theaters uh, that just don't have the budget to hire uh, live musicians. Um, community theaters typically don't have the budgets. Uh, the large professional theaters, you know, I, I really wish all of them would use live music. They don't all do that. Um, and I understand, but uh, you know, Carol and I have created tracks for for smaller theaters, for high schools that don't have a budget to hire musicians. So we'll do those types of tracks. Um, I have the ability to record at home. Uh, I actually have a degree in computer science, so I'm very technical, um, and I use a lot of electronics uh, in my own performance due to space constraints. A lot of the pits don't have room for timpani and xylophone, all that stuff. So I use electronics in conjunction with acoustic equipment uh, in the pit. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, tracks, and also from a, an, an educational standpoint, I'd like to see more high schools uh, that are doing musical theater use their own in-house uh, band program uh, to, 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 as a training ground for those students sure, to learn how to perform to in, in a musical setting, which is very different than, than other this, types of musical settings. This is a settings. hot button that I get asked yep. a lot about, and yep. I, I want to throw a couple of things real sure. and get some reaction. One is that there are shows, The Wick is a good example, that does shows that scream for a la large ensemble, mm -hmm. and uh, either you're going to spend an immense amount of money, which I'm not saying you should mm -hmm. or shouldn't, or you get really good tracks because there are some rotten sure. sets of tracks. But the other thing is to look at what uh, Palm Beach Drama Works has been doing in their summer shows. They will take and reconfigure and reorchestrate a piece, which normally would have eight, nine, ten pieces, and bring it down to four or five. Mm -hmm. And if the musical director is really good and can capture it, sometimes you don't feel like you're being cheated. So there's like four or five paradigms out there that can be used. Are there yeah, others but, well, most that of the theaters here of? don't have the budget to use the original orchestration for a lot of these shows. Right. So most of the shows I do, it's scaled down anyway. I mean, I've done West Side Story with eight, nine people. Wow. So, you know, and, and, but we do it, and, yeah. and it sounds great, you know. Um, you know, unfortunately, people come in and they expect these huge, lush-sounding right. orchestras, um, but, you know... That usually it's comes a with a huge, lush budget. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So it, yeah. it's a, it's a trade-off. Yeah. It's a compromise. And it's tricky because, you know, there's many of us consider ourselves purists in terms of I want to hear what that orchestration is supposed to be live. Mm -hmm. But I also think uh, not to be the the stodgy old man who doesn't you know is too provincial in his ways, to reconsider what pure is. And um, I think that's changing. I wonder if you think that's changing with technology. For instance, we know playing in a theater pit or playing a gig in a nightclub or on a different stage is a completely different animal. Mm -hmm. However, both have cutting edge technology that allows the musicians to do certain things they wouldn't otherwise be able to do, like use click tracks mm -hmm. and backing tracks. Mm -hmm. And so I know that you use the, some of those in your gigs outside of theater as well, and most bands do these days. Right. So is the idea of what a pure musical experience is changing? It's absolutely changing, especially if you look at a lot of the, the tours that are out there. They're putting um, the percussion book on synthesizer now. So they'll travel with a smaller complement. They don't need to hire as many local musicians. They're putting a lot more instrumentation on synthesizers. There is also software out there that allows a music director or a musician to add instruments that aren't being played live on a keyboard just by pushing a button 
and they'll add in strings, let's huh. say, and they just keep time by pushing a key. We did that last year at West Boca High School with Annie. We augmented some of the, uh, the orchestration with uh, just by adding in is, instruments, and you could choose which instrument you want to do, and that's happening a lot more Is frequently. this a matter of budget, or is it it's simply budget. a matter of the technologies there now, so? Well, the, techno the technology is assisting with those that are budget challenged. <laughs> Got it. You so mentioned it that, um, that, uh, that more um, school musicians should play for the shows there. Now, when I was in school, before I wanted to be an actor, I wanted to be a musician. So mm -hmm. I was a violinist, and I played in the orchestra, and we played for the school shows, uh, for the school musicals. Did, is that it, at some point did that no longer happen? Did, when the arts start, started to get cut, were those? Well, um, part of it also because of the technology, <laughs> what we're talking about with tracks, because now tracks are available to them. Before, when we were in school, mm -hmm. tracks didn't exist. Right. So you had to use live musicians, whether it was kids from the school, you hired local professionals, uh, like a lot of them still do. Um, you know, the, the education in the music department is still there. It's just they don't seem to work together as well as they used to uh, between the music department and the theater department to coordinate schedules so the kids are available to perform in, in, in those pits. Got uh, it's it. a great training ground. Got it. And I wish more schools would do it. Although we're going to take a quick break and take a look at uh, another video right now. Great stuff. So cool. Okay. <laughs> so, my friend, right. explain that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, I got a call a few years ago from the manager of a, a, a startup Pink Floyd tribute band, asking me if I'd be interested in joining the band. Um, in the past, uh, in the past few years, I've kind of shied away from being in bands just because I'm working so much in musical theater. It's hard to have the time to then do those types of, of gigs. Um, but this was a, an interesting project and one that I knew wasn't going to work every weekend because we can't do bars. It's a big uh, concert production. Um, so I, I agreed, joined the band, and um, it's a group of like-minded musicians from all over South Florida, from down from Miami all the way up to Port St. Lucie. And um, we created a, this Pink Floyd experience. Uh, we're trying to be as true as possible to the original Pink Floyd music. And it's a big production. We have the full laser light show, the LCD projection screen behind us showing all the video clips and stuff. And uh, we do large concerts. We just did a very uh, great gig at Meisner Park. Had about 2,000 people. Wow. Uh, it and looks it's... amazing. How often do you do them? How many times um, a year would you say? We, we do probably uh, two to three concerts a year at this point. Again, we need larger venues. It's not a bar band. Uh, so we need to find the right venue. Speaking uh, I, of that, it, it, you know, we were talking about the differences between a theater pit and between uh, a, a bar band or a cover mm -hmm. band or, right. or even an original band. What, in your opinion, you know, you've done both, I've done both, but it's, typical, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge to get guys or girls that are used to doing gigs that can pay two, three hundred bucks, even a hundred bucks a night at doing bar gigs to sit in a pit for three or four weeks or whatever the run is for maybe 50 bucks a show or something like that. And you know once you're committed to a show, your weekends are gone for that right. run. What makes a musician choose one or the other? Or, or are they completely separate animals in terms of musicians from your experience? Um, the, uh, the, the bar band musician and the, the pit orchestra musician typically are different. I mean, there's some overlap. Um, you typically don't find a lot of readers in the, the bar band. Mm -hmm. uh, even in the wedding band circuit, I mean, you'll, you'll find some readers, but you don't find a lot of musicians who, who read. Um, 
what I enjoy about pit work and doing musical theater is, like you said, it's three to four weeks. Uh, for me, uh, I have a lot of equipment, and so I get to set it up once, <laughs> and then show up, sit Good down, point. play my gig, leave where, and I, I've done the weekend warrior, I've done a lot of weddings and parties, and you're, you're constantly schlepping equipment inside mm -hmm. and out. Um, I joke that I, I, I just basically drag equipment around and occasionally I get to play it. Uh, but there, there is a difference between that musician. Uh, also, the steady work of doing musical theater is appealing. You know, having that three or four works of appointment and then maybe a week or two off and then going to another show. Do you think, Whereas, that it, do you think it has to do a lot with the actual music being performed? I mean, do pit musicians have a real passion for the scores they're playing as opposed to doing, you know... Uh, you know, well, Tom Petty covers in a bar, yeah. or f even for a wedding, which can be very lucrative for mm -hmm. musicians. Right. I mean, for me, you know, that's why the Pink Floyd band, the experience is, is a nice outlet for me, a departure from the musical theater. But what I love about musical theater, uh, and I think other musicians uh, are similar, is that you get to do a lot of different styles of music through the course of a single show or just going from show mm -hmm. to show. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing about, uh, you know, my training, I, had this, I have a versatile background, and so it enables me to play a lot of different styles of music, which is required for musical theater, where if you're just in a, in a bar band and you're playing Tom Petty or whatever, you know, you're playing classic rock or covers that you know. That you was know. something I wanted to ask you about. Um, I've seen you, I saw you a few months ago doing the Frank Sinatra catalog in my way. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently saw you playing uh, good old rock and roll in Greece. Yes. And I may or may not have remembered, but I think you were in one of the Hedwig bands at one point or another? No. I did okay. Rock of Ages. That's you did what it Rock was, of Rock of Ages. Ages. That's it. Yes. You do such a wide variety of styles. As a musician, is it hard to switch? Do you find that, my God, this is a whole different ball game? Or is it really all, is it just music? Uh, to me, it's music. Uh, having listened to a lot of different types of music growing up and being exposed to a lot of different types of music. Um, but you have, to, you have to put in the time and you have to study the different styles that you're required to play, you know, so you could try to do it as authentically as possible. Uh, so that's a big part of it. And as you were asking about preparation, yeah. a large part of that preparation is kind of understanding the genre that you're playing, you know, for the different shows. Do you have a favorite? Do I have a favorite? Um, I tell you, I loved Rock of Ages. I loved Motown. Um, no, I did Memphis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I love uh, the old uh, R&B. Uh, Aretha Franklin stuff, you know, uh, old uh, James Brown, funk, that kind of stuff. But I, I, if it's done well, I enjoy pretty much playing any kind of music. Um, I, as I was going to say before uh, we cut to the Pink Floyd tape that um, I saw a production of Ain't Misbehaving recently up in Palm Beach County, Love and they show. did have live musicians, which was which I was really glad to see. But I wanted to ask you who some of your favorite drummers are. Some of my favorite drummers. Yeah. Um, well, Buddy Rich is an obvious choice. I got to see Buddy Rich when I was a kid. Amazing drummer. Wow, you saw um, him. I did. <laughs> I saw him in concert. He came to my hometown uh, when I was younger. And uh, amazing. That's um, who that clip reminded me of. The opening clip, that's exactly who I was thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Steve Gadd was a very, very well-known drummer back in the 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. He still tours with Eric Clapton, but he's playing on a lot of albums. Uh, amazing drummer. One that a lot of people don't know, his name is Omar Hakim. And he played uh, on Sting's uh, uh, album when he was kind of mixing uh, jazz and pop. And now was actually teaching at Berkeley. Um, but, you know, I like, I like drummers that have a combination of really good groove and have some chops, but don't feel like they need to show them off all the time. Mm. You didn't mention the drumming god. It was Neil Peart. Neil Peart, yes. I like <laughs> Neil Peart. He's amazing. Now, other than people calling you up, how do you get gigs? Do you have an agent? Um, how no, does that work? again, it's it's networking. Okay. In this business, it's all networking. Who you know, you know, the more people you work with, uh, hopefully they give your name to other people, and then you get calls. Again, from musical theater, it's the MDs typically. Uh, that and I've worked with pretty much every MD in the region now, so they all know me, know my work. It becomes a matter me. of reputation then. It's reputation, right? There's no audition for this type of. There's stuff. no website that people should go to. No, I mean, I have a website. You know, Carol and I have our own website. And what is that website? <laughs> Funny you should ask. Fantelmusic.com. And we list all the different things that we do uh, there. But, Excellent. Uh, what, yes. about, what about the Pink Floyd experience? If, if you know, someone wants to get in touch with, with someone about, yep. about uh, booking that, mm -hmm. how, how would they do so? Uh, Floydattribute.com is the website, and I created that website. I also do websites for other people. Because oh. you have because nothing I have else that going IT on. IT background. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> Nothing Excellent. else going on. Speaking right? of Fantel music, yes. it, music education is so critical for our whole life yes. and culture. What is, in your opinion, from your perspective as a teacher, the state of music education like these days? Um, it's okay. I actually do clinician work in a few middle schools uh, in Coral Springs where I live, and so I get to go in and work with percussionists, and it's nice that the band teachers recognize the need to bring in uh, specialists in their field to come in and work with their students because they're so overwhelmed trying to teach, you know, 60 kids at a time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the band programs are still pretty strong. Um, <coughs> what I try to focus on in, uh, in, in my studio is, is reading because that has enabled me to be a professional musician and a working musician, uh, it's hard to, to make a living doing bar work. You can make a living doing weddings, um, but you know, reading to me is extremely important, <coughs> being literate in music, and so I try to teach that in my studio. Literate in music, that's good, that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It really is. Yep. Um, okay, so we're gonna wrap up, but before we do, very quickly, to ask you, in one sentence, what advice would you give to a young musician who's just starting out in South Florida today? Uh, basically, I would tell them to, if they're interested in musical theater work, find out who the musicians are doing it uh, in your area, if you're a drummer, you know, myself, there are other musicians. Find out who the MDs are, go to, the, go to see shows, introduce yourself, try to sit in the pit uh, and observe. Uh, and get to know other musicians because Excellent. networking is key. Roy Fantel, you're the best. Thank you thank so you. much thank for joining you for us. Me. I appreciate it. And thank you for joining us. I want to thank our panelists for being with us today and say they're the best. They really are. We can't do it without you, our audience. I want to thank Roy for, for um, sharing himself with us today. So thank you, my friend. Thank you. And I want to thank you all again for watching today. Spotlight on the Arts is a community program. That means we want you, the community, to get involved. You may subscribe to our email newsletter or simply drop us a line for suggestions or encouragement. We'll take either one. Our email address is spotlightonthearts at BrowardSchools.com. And while you're at your complete <laughs> computer, please go to SouthFloridaOnStage.com and check out the theater reviews and arts calendar. Pick out a show, and as Iris Acker would always say, Go, Go to the, to the theater. theater. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.